Hi Rakarimba. To celebrate World Biodiversity Day, we want to take you on a journey over the next three days to explore how biodiversity defines Malaysia through our Biodiversity Series Classroom. Today, we're talking about getting to know flora and fauna of Malaysia and over the next three episodes, you will be making different parts of a diorama which we will assemble on the last day. What is biodiversity? Biodiversity means the variety of plant and animal life or biology in the world or in a particular habitat. It is a combination of the words biological and diversity. A high level of biodiversity is considered to be important and desirable. So why is biodiversity desirable? A large collection of biological specimens boosts ecosystem productivity, where each species, no matter how small, have an important role to play in the web of life. A large and connected area that houses this collection of biodiversity is also important in order to ensure the resilience and sustainability of these species. For example, a large number of plant species mean a greater variety of plants to eat. Greater species diversity and species population ensures natural sustainability for all life forms. Imagine huge elephants with big appetites that spend around 12 to 18 hours a day feeding, would be able to eat many different plants and are able to roam a vast area of vegetation. With a greater species of plant diversity to eat and a large area for them to roam, it allows the previous plants eaten by these elephants to recover and go back. The different plants also provide them with different vitamins and minerals to grow, stay strong and healthy. Food availability and variety is very important for a healthy animal population, kind of like us when our mom tells us to eat our veggies, rice and meat. Malaysia is a mega diverse country. Despite our small size, we have a huge collection of different species of plants and animals. A mega diverse country must have at least 5,000 species of endemic plants and must border marine ecosystems. Endemic means plants and animals that can only be found in a particular place and nowhere else. Wow, can you imagine how unique our Malaysian biodiversity is? These plants and animals are so precious that we have protected areas across the country to keep them safe and healthy. Being a mega diverse location has its advantages as we form part of a migratory path for birds that fly south in the winter and back north to roost in the spring. Our year-round abundance of green rainforests supplies migratory birds with enough insects, small vertebrates, temporary shelter and water bodies like lakes and ponds to rest. No place is complete without a large variety of bird species and we are home to 10 different types of hornbills among other magnificent birds. Many people enjoy birding, come to Malaysia just to travel across the country to see our colourful feathered friends. We host some of the largest and smallest animals in the world, besides having an endemic population like the Malayan tiger, Borneo pygmy elephant, Borneo orangutan, proboscis monkey, just to name a few. Our gibbons are the only singing apes in the world and can be heard for long distances in the forest. Each song is different to communicate about food, movement, or even show affection. Our rainforest branches are exciting places too with sun bears, clouded leopards, tree frogs, pangolins, and kalugos, each adapted to their habitat. Watch our other online classroom videos to find out more about our Malaysian animals. Animals are not just consumers in their habitat. They also contribute towards ecosystem services like spreading fertilizer in the form of poop. Invertebrate organisms, sometimes called detritivores, which include earthworms, termites, and millipedes, help decompose dead animals and fallen trees. Carnivores, preying on other animals, balance populations. And herbivores, browsing shrubs to clear the overgrowth and spread seeds from the fruits that they eat. This is how fruiting plants move from one area to the next in a poop seed bomb. Some trees, like the dipterocarps, have wing seeds that propel in the wind and float on the water to move to new areas. Dipterocarps can grow very tall and very large. They form a very large proportion of the rainforest canopy here in Peninsular Malaysia. An extensive study showed that up to 57% of the emergent layer of the lowland forest in Peninsular Malaysia is composed of dipterocarps. 
Emergent layers are the tallest trees in the rainforest. Diphtheric cloud forests are far from uniform across Borneo. Depending on altitude, the diversity of plants vary and can change their overall appearance. In areas below 150 meters, lowland diphtheric cloud forests often contain many trees from the leguminous family and massive strangulatic plants. Forest trees come in all shapes and sizes. When you go hiking, look at the different leaves you find on the ground. Each shape and size tells you it's a different tree. Look up, you might see a magnificent view of crown shyness or hear birds who have picked an area with fruiting trees. If you're lucky, you might spot a stick insect, a leaf frog or a spider. A big group of plants I find fascinating are palm trees. Some palms you might know are like coconut, nipah, sea coconut or pinang. They have fruits that people love to drink on hot days and eat with the ice kacang or eat as a traditional snack to boost energy. Many traditional homes today have thatched roofs made of woven palm leaves and floors of palm trunks. My favourite thing about palms is that they produce sugar-rich sap which are collected to become gula kabong, gula melaka, gula apong and many more. Orchids are also forest plants that have been domesticated. Many orchids need the humid and cool shades of the forest to thrive. They bring colour to the forest and influence unique insects to mimic them. The orchid praying mantis is a great example. It can live for 5-6 to six months and can adapt their colour naturally to shades of pink and purple to mimic the flowers they live around. Butterflies and moths have wonderful patterns and bright colours. They can be seen landing at salt deposits. Many of our large trees bloom, seed and fruit seasonally with the monsoon and drought. So the forest is constantly replenishing itself with new growth with the help of pollinators like moths, bees and bats, while other animals help seeds move and grow in different areas. We see these seasons as fruiting seasons. You know, where we see lots of durians, rambutans and mangoes, dukus and langsat being sold at the store? These are traditional forest tree species that our great-grandfathers started cultivating around their homes and later on in farms because more people moved away from rural villages and could only buy them from stalls and supermarkets. Many forest plants have also been used to make all sorts of medicine. Traditionally, their roots, barks and leaves are boiled to make broth, while modern medicine extracts the properties to make vaccines and antibiotics. Our large terrestrial animals adapt to these seasonal weather changes by moving over land into different areas of the forest. This is why the central forest spine is an important conservation site for peninsular Malaysia, just like the heart of Borneo in Sabah and Sarawak. The forest complexes are so large they span several states and in Borneo, several countries, which include our neighbours Brunei and Kalimantan, Indonesia. It is very important that they stay intact and are not fragmented as these areas not only have a large variety of plant species but animal species that depend on them. These forests are some of the oldest forest systems in the world. Did you know that the Malaysian rainforest is one of the oldest forests in the world? Even older than its sister rainforest in the Amazon located in South America? So, if you've been following our Rimba classroom over the last three weeks, you will know that our tropical rainforest has different unique layers that support different plants and animals. This means that within a small area, a rainforest is super diverse and intense. It's just like a huge apartment, with many habitats stacked vertically and horizontally. So, why is biodiversity important to us since we don't live in the forest? Well, as we've heard today, a biodiverse and healthy rainforest provide us with so many of our unique fruits, animals, and plant-based resources. Besides giving us great ecological support, many people from around the world visit us each year to experience our rainforest, eat our fruits, and experience our Malaysian cuisine. Our food, like our plants and animals, can't be found anywhere else in the world because they are very influenced by our local resources. Like our kueh, they are coloured and flavoured with pandan, or dishes made of bamboo shoots, or even umai, a Melanau fish dish from Sarawak. Now that we know a little bit about our rainforest and the animals that live inside it, let's learn how to draw a pangolin. The pangolin is one of our endangered species. In fact, it's the most traded mammal on the illegal black market. Help save the pangolin by making a tunnel diorama and you can send this to a friend, a teacher or your local leader with a note on why it is important to save our endangered animals. 
I will also include a few other endangered animals for you to draw. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow as we explore more endangered animals within our rainforest and on day 3 where we will learn how the forest ecosystem regulates rainfall, creates oxygen, stores carbon dioxide and filters water. And we will then assemble all the bits to make our diorama. Bye guys! So we're going to start with cutting out this shape with your art block and we're going to measure it. So that's about 14.5 and 21 okay so you're gonna need two pieces of art blocks yeah so we're gonna go this way 14.5 and remember we need two we need two 14.5s yeah I'm just going to draw this one first. And then I'll do 21. What? Sorry, so 21 will be this way. And that's 21. Then another one down here. this line here okay I'm gonna use a blade and I'm gonna press a li against the ruler against the line Okay, so if you realize I made a bit of a uneven cut here, so I'm gonna mark these corners, this side and this side. It's okay, I can still use that, it's just a small thing. I'm gonna cut my art block out. Okay, so now you have four of these and you have the extra pieces of paper. So I want you to keep everything for the next three days right so on the first piece of paper okay so we're going to use these two okay so we're going to draw the pangolin so what i'm going to do is i'm going to draw a general shape I think I'm gonna do a face head and I'm gonna make a long tail then I'm gonna okay give that maybe I'll draw this one as well so now my pangolin
going to erase all my guides. You can look on the internet, you can find other photographs of, as well to follow. Um, yeah. Okay, I think I am penguin ready. Does that look no? That looks a bit weird. Okay, so they have um flaws. Okay, so now the pangolins body a scale scan so we have to make some guidelines the scales are quite small Okay, and their scales start from the top pen. So it's really a V shape with a round on top. So you can actually just do like literally like fish scales. The scales happen, you know, are arranged in rows. So you want to keep it expanding in rows. So the reason why we are drawing the pangolin is because the pangolin is one of the most traded endangered wildlife in Malaysia and there's a total ban of pangolin um, hunting, trading, um, eating in Sarawak so yeah that's how precious they are in our Malaysian forests Okay, so down the lake you do the same thing because you know when they wrap around and they become a ball they cover everything including their face so here they are still scales it's just that they're really small Ok, 
Okay, that's your pangolin. So now all we have to do now is to cut the pangolin out. So using a scissors. So if you heard our story from the Orang Asli Tales yesterday, uh, we told a story about, we read a story about a pangolin and how when he, this particular pangolin, when he hunts for ants, he, he acts dead by lying down next to an anthill. And so the, and when he's lying down, he's so relaxed that he puts his, um, all his scales facing upwards and the ants thinking that he's dead will come and, um, get in between his scales and when he feels there's a lot of ants stuck between all his scales uh, he quickly move he shuts his scales flat and he goes to a river and uh, all the ants and he opens his um, scales again and then what happens is that the ants will get released and they will float and he'll eat them up as they float in their groups. So he had a very unique hunting strategy. And according to that story, when uh, one day he was waiting to do the same thing, hunt at the end hill, an elephant came by and the elephant was quite grumpy. And so the elephant uh, saw him and grabbed him and tried to toss him aside because he thought it was just another dead animal and him being alive and totally afraid because the elephant had uh, picked him up really high and uh, tried to throw him into the bushes and when that didn't work uh, knocked him against the tree uh, he got so disorientated that he hung on tighter and he didn't let go and this had gone on for like, the story said two days and two nights and the elephant got exhausted and he didn't have any food and uh, the elephant died and, but the pangolin not knowing that the elephant had died and he was super afraid uh, he too died because he didn't realize that the elephant had died and that he was already on the ground and yeah it's quite a tragedy that they both died but what happened was um, among a uh, folk tale it became the story about how the pangolin killed the elephant so now people think that the pangolin is like super strong and it could kill an elephant but actually it was just this myth that uh, was misunderstood and yeah today people hunt and eat pangolin because they think it has medicinal properties when it is really just a myth. There's been no scientific evidence of uh, eating pangolin skin, I mean pangolin scales or pangolin meat to be of any medicinal value. Okay, so that's my little pangolin.
I'm going to cut out my elephant, my sun bear and my orangutan. And tomorrow, we will... Um, tomorrow, we will draw some plants that are herbaceous, which um, the animals tend to eat. Uh, one of the plants will have some berries, which I know the siamangs love to eat. And uh, the other plant is a carnivorous pitcher plant that eats insects. So tomorrow, if you join us again, you will be able to learn how to draw those two plants. And um, maybe that will improve the way you see different plants when you go into the forest or into an area with a lot of trees. So I'm just going to cut out my elephant as close to the body as we can and I will show you how big I've drawn this on the ruler so tomorrow when you are drawing your plants you have a gauge of how big to draw all the different parts of the plants okay so cutting it out today is important for tomorrow and it will help us work a lot faster when we get to the third day when we are drawing the background.